The Christmas story isn't just another story. It's our story. And it's not a finished story. It's the beginning of a story that's still being told. All the sights, all the sounds, and all the songs of Christmas are meant to remind us that this isn't just a random collection of words on a page. It's a story that's been crafted with great intention and care. A story that was created with every person in mind. A story that was meant for you and meant for me. Good morning. You guys made it through the snow, the brave few. I love it. I imagine there are many more online. Um, But like Brian said, my name is Emily Jameson. Yes, I hail from Gig Harbor. And it is such a treat to be with you. I feel like this is extended family. Um, There is one church, right? And so I hail from the church down south, and I come to the church up north. And I love that all throughout scripture, whenever someone is sending a letter or arriving at a new place with some information, they send greetings. And so I thought this morning it would be really fun to bring greetings from my family and um, and a little poem that I wrote that's actually on the back of our Christmas card this year. So first, um, I'll introduce you. So my husband, Marshall, tall drink of water there. And then we've got four boys. So yes, a frat house at home. Um, My oldest is 15, Tucker. We've got Bennett, who's 12. Wesley's 10. Finn is 7. We're actually holding a saw. You can't really see it in the picture, but we are about to cut our Christmas tree in that picture. So it's the one photo that we got. So even though you can't see Finn's eyes, that's what we had to go with. Um, That being said, every year, I I love poetry. And every year, I'm sort of like a constipated artist. You know, it just comes out on our Christmas card. That's a terrible analogy. I apologize. Um, But I write a poem every year and put it on the back of our Christmas card. So I thought I would read it to you this morning. Over the water, across the bridge, to the Jameson house we go, where coffee's a brewin' and kids are a stewin' and Marshall's hair has a nice flow. Life is quite hectic, this morning our septic did overflow into the tub, true story. But we braved the cold weather and held it together as Wazoo was beat by UW. Our oldest is ready to shave and to drive, and our youngest still needs a nightlight. The span of our convos is deep and is wide. Each day is not without a fight. But forgiveness abounds and great laughter resounds. We're grateful for every morn when God's mercies are fresh and our hearts are addressed by the one who this season was born. To a first century teen, in a barn not so clean, and a dad of great honor and grit, that miracle birth would bring the world mirth, and a promise to one day sure split. The hearts of a people, wide open with promise of friendship, beyond comprehension. Yes, the darkness would flee, and the captives set free, quite merely at the mention. Of the name above names, the God of all fame, who bowed low to serve you and me and offer his spirit to live in the hearts of those willing to bend on a knee to the one who is savior, our peace and our friend, our counselor, delight and joy, and mysteriously came to enter the world as a humble and sweet baby boy. I I wanna talk to you this morning about that first century teen, about Mary. And a few weeks ago, Grant gave a a beautiful sermon, I would encourage you to go back and listen, where he kind of overviews a lot of different things, and we're going to kind of dive deep into the womb of that teenage girl, and figure out what was going on there, and wonder what the invitation is for us today. And so I actually um, had a conversation with Scott Erickson, who, when he lived in Bellingham, he actually came to this church, and he gave me permission to use a few of his his illustrations to just provoke some thought this morning. And this first, I think about Mary. Mary, this first century teen who was encountered by heaven. And I want to stop first to just ask you to remember a time when you perhaps encountered heaven. And so I'm just going to invite you, close your eyes, just for the sake of focus. And I just want you to ask, when was the time that I encountered heaven? God, would you remind us of a time that you were with us and we did not know? Or perhaps of a time when we certainly encountered you and did know. And then just ask this, what was my reaction? What has your response been when you encountered something otherworldly? 
that caused you to come to awareness of the reality that there is more than what we can see, taste, and touch. God, I thank you for this morning. I thank you that we are about to dive into your word and that your scriptures are alive, that you have been speaking for centuries and you will continue to speak this morning. And God, I pray that you would translate between my mouth and the hearts of the people listening exactly what it is that you want them to hear. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Let's dive in. We're in Luke 1. And I love one of my favorite Bible teachers, Jill Briscoe. She was teaching the 23rd Psalm one point in time, and I just loved what she said because so often we can be very familiar with a scripture. You've probably heard this story or maybe it's been read on Christmas morning. But she says this, she says, we, we have a good shepherd and, and he grows new grass in familiar pastures overnight, overnight. He grows new grass in familiar pastures overnight. And so I want to invite you to lean in and wonder what fresh nourishment might come from the scripture for you this morning. What is the thing that God wants to illuminate in your heart this morning? Now in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph a descendant of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary, and coming to her, the angel said, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was greatly perplexed at what he said. Is that not maybe an understatement? I don't know about you, but if I'm in my bedroom and a big shiny man shows up and is like, Greetings, favored one, I'm like, Oh, wow. I mean, I'm a little perplexed right now, a little perplexed. What is this? Who are you? Why are you calling me a favored one? You know, I mean, I just wonder about her response. She's greatly perplexed. And the interesting thing about this is for all of Scripture, we actually see many, many, many times where heaven encounters earth and angels come, and they always say what? Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. And most of the time, people fall down flat. They look like they're dead. They freak out. Mary... Mary does not fall down. She's like, hmm, I'm a little confused by your greeting. Help me understand. Favored one? She's per- she, he hasn't even said yet that she's about to be a virgin birth of God, right? I mean, she, he hasn't even gotten to the really crazy part yet. But the part that she's most perplexed by is his greeting. Greetings, favored one. God is with you. My question for you this morning is that if heaven, if heaven encountered you this morning, which I trust God does want to encounter each and every one of you this morning, and you heard from the voice of God greetings, highly favored one, would you be able to receive that greeting? It strikes me here that being favored is not about your circumstances. It's not about being rich or married or of high status or anything else. It merely is tied to the reality that God is with her. To be favored is to be with God. And I think so many of us have been sold sort of a bag of goods or somewhere along the line come into this way of thinking that says, oh, being favored is that my circumstances are great. Things are easy, life is straight, things are predictable, I am certain. And so if life is a mess or broken or, gosh, any number of things, we then immediately allow our circumstances to dictate the fact that God is not with me and I am not favored. Rather than recognizing that God's presence with me is what tells me I am favored and that's what allows me and enables me to walk through the mess of this world. We cannot let our circumstances define who God is. We must let God define our circumstances. And so Mary is greeted by this angel. Greetings, highly favored one. And I greet you the same way this morning. Greetings, highly favored ones. The Lord is with you. He will enable you to walk through whatever he desires to birth through you. The angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. He repeats it again. Why do you think he repeats it? 
Why do you think God repeats things to us? Because he didn't quite get it the first time, I think, right? I can't tell you how often I've come to the Lord and said, God, what do you want me to do? And I just sense this still, I've never heard God's voice audibly, but I just sense in my spirit, I love you. And I'm like, I, I know, but what do you want me to do? <laughs> I love you. Like, well, I, get, I get that, but, but do I? So often I'm asking, what do you want me to do? Because I'm actually trying to get validation and love and affirmation and all of those things. And a mentor of mine so brilliantly said, God desires for us to live from love, not for love. He desires for us to live from love, not for love. So when we receive the love of God, when we actually believe and trust that he is with us and for us, that I am favored by way of his presence with me, then guess what? I operate entirely differently in the world. Whatever I do is not for the affirmation or the favor of man, but as a result of the presence and the goodness of God, and I'm able to be generous with my time and my resources and my gifts and my love because I have enough. So he repeats himself. Mary, you have found favor with God. Listen carefully. Can we listen this morning? Listen carefully. You will conceive in your womb and give birth to a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and eminent and will be called Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob, Israel, forever. And his kingdom, and of his kingdom, there shall be no end. Wow, this got good. I mean, first you're just favored and you're with God, and now you're about to give birth to God. I mean, this really took a turn. And I love her response. Her response. Mary said to the angel, how will this be? How will this be? And it's very different than Zechariah, her cousin's response just a few chapters before, and I encourage, or not even in the same chapter, many sentences before, but Zechariah encounters an angel who says, your wife, your old barren wife, is actually going to have a baby, and he says, how could this be? He asks a question. He's also perplexed, but his question seems to come out of skepticism and doubt, and like, there's no way. Whereas Mary's question comes from like, how will you do it? I just, it's a simple, beautiful, honest question. Since I'm a virgin, and I've had no intimacy with any man, she's had the talk, um, so she knows how this goes, guys. Um, then the angel replied to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you like a cloud. For that reason, the holy, pure, sinless child shall be called the Son of God. I imagine she was like, good, that clears it up. Thank you. I mean, really, there are so many problems here. You know what I mean? There's so many perplexities. How is it, what? The spirit of the living God will overshadow you. What does this even mean? We do not have room, even in our theology, to understand how this could be. God is in mystery, isn't he? I love this phrase that God is, God is not unknowable, he's eternally knowable, which means you can never get to the end of him. So there's always questions, more questions, more perplexity, more wonderment. And it's what makes a journey with Jesus so profoundly beautiful and adventurous. He never gets tired. He never gets old. I just love that Mary isn't grasping for information on how it will work, but she's grasping for the one who will make it work. Are we more concerned about informational accuracy, what we know, or are we more concerned about relational authenticity? Am I authentically moving toward God, asking the questions? I may not understand it all, but I want to keep asking, how will this be? What is your invitation? What do you want me to know? And if there's something that is not for me to know, I trust you, because you withhold no good thing from those you love. And so if there's something I don't know yet, then it's probably not good for me. Can you trust him with even what you don't know? She asked that question, how will this be? I love this. Author Def Debbie Thomas uses this phrase, holy bewilderment. And she writes this of the Annunciation. The second line I appreciate in the Annunciation story describes Mary's confusion. But she was much perplexed. 
It is not that the Annunciation leads her out of doubt and into faith. It is that her encounter with the angel leads her out of certainty and into holy bewilderment. Be quite clear that certainty is not faith. Faith might be assurance of what you cannot see, but certainty is something that will be quite dismantled when you encounter heaven. You might become more and more sure of who God is and who he says you are, but I trust in my experience that you will know less and less and less about what is to come. And there is something beautiful in the trusting of God in that process. And so my questions always to God are, God, who do you say that you are? And who do you say that I am? Because if I can be sure about those things, then I can encounter anything when I do not know what is coming. There's great hope in our God. She goes on to say this. It's her encounter with the angel. It leads her out of certainty and into holy bewilderment, out of familiar spiritual territory and into a lifetime of pondering, wondering, questioning, and wrestling. She was much perplexed, or as she puts it to Gabriel, how can this be? In the aftermath of Gabriel's announcement, Mary has to consent to evolve, to wonder, to stretch. She has to learn that faith and doubt are not opposites, that beyond all the easy platitudes and pieties of religion, we serve a God who dwells in mystery. If we agree to embark on a journey with this God, we will face periods of bewilderment. How many of you have encountered bewilderment in your journey of faith? How many of you that scared you a little bit? Like, oh no, what is happening? And here's what I trust, that if you are really encountering heaven, you will encounter perplexity. You will encounter bewilderment. And it is the invitation to the deeper places. It is a wild adventure. It is not safe, but it is good. Yes, this frightens us, so we compartmentalize our spiritual lives, trying to hold our relationship with God at a sanitized remove from our, from our actual circumstances. We don't realize that such efforts leave us with a faith that is rigid, inflexible, and stale. I don't want a faith that is rigid and inflexible and stale. I want one that is vibrant and moving and colorful and dynamic and able to handle all that this broken world might throw at me. And it's found in the person of Jesus. This person who is our hope, who is our favor. Mary goes on to say, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. May it, be, may it be done to me according to your word. She surrenders. It is a holy consent. Where else would I go? What else would I do? This is what I desire. And I trust that so much of her consent is rooted in the initial greeting. For a God that comes to me, says that he is with me, says that I am highly favored, then I will walk through anything. He is with you. He is for you. He will enable you to carry and birth and walk through anything that might come. I was struck, it was a few weeks ago, and I was with a bunch of high school students. I run our student leadership program in our area. Um, and there were a couple young men in the room, well, actually many, it was really fun, but a couple of young men in particular that responded to this thing. I said, do you know that you are pregnant with God? Right? Because the Holy Spirit has come to take up residence in us. And they are hilarious in 17. And so one grabs his Bible and sticks it under his you know, shirt. And the one next to him goes, ha ha, how far along are you? You know? And I just, I had to laugh. It was so great. But it was this beautiful picture of the word becoming flesh and actually wanting to take up residence in us and work something out in our lives. And a friend of mine offered this great analogy. She said, if you could do a spiritual ultrasound, what would you find inside of you? If you did an ultrasound of the spiritual thing, do you know that you carry gifts? You carry the fruit of the Spirit. You carry all sorts of things. In some of us, these things are dormant. What does it look like to fan into flame the gift that God has given you? What does it look like to actually allow something to grow up in you, to actually leap inside of you in the same way that happens next? Now, this, at this time, Mary arose and hurried to the hill country, to the city of Judah, Judea, 
And she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. Now remember, just before, the angel said to her, by the way, also, your cousin, the, the old one, you know, she's about to have a baby. And essentially what you see there is the spirit was actually by way of the angel, right? The angel is a messenger of God. The spirit is a messenger of God to us. And so the angel tells Mary her next step. We so often don't know what's coming or how it's gonna go, but God is so kind that he will often illuminate just your next right step. So in that same vision, you're about to have a baby and your cousin also, she's gonna have a baby. And she's like, oh, that's what I'm gonna do next. So she scurries off to go see her cousin Elizabeth. Now recognize, remember, that it was the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy that the angel Gabriel came to Mary. How far along is Mary when she gets to Elizabeth right now? Like nada, zero. If you read a little bit further, it says Mary stayed three months and then John was born, which means that Mary received this news from the angel, hopped on her donkey. I don't know what she, I don't know what her, (laughs) maybe her feet. She had some sandals. They were slick. And she scurried over to see Elizabeth And is she showing yet? Are you showing the first days? No. She shows up at Elizabeth's house, and this is what happens. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, her baby leaped in her womb. So here's John, six months in. He's jumping around in there, very excited. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and empowered by him. So Elizabeth now has wisdom and insight and understanding and a great amount of faith, this courage that we see come whenever the Holy Spirit fills someone. And she exclaims loudly, blessed, worthy to be praised are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And how has it happened to me that the mother of my Lord would come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy and blessed spiritually fortunate and favored by god is she who believed and confidently trusted that there would be a fulfillment of the things that were spoken to her by the angel sent from the lord are you someone that when another person comes and shares with you i think i sense something from god the lord is developing something he's given me this dream this idea Are you someone that rejoices over that person? That even when there's no fruit of a life changed yet, that you will speak life and glory and praise and encouragement over that person. When you encounter heaven and something is is seated in you, you're like, God, you're doing something. I have this idea, this hope, this dream, this thing I want to resolve as something sort of burgeons up in you from the spirit. Are there people that you know even one that you can run to and say, I think, I think I heard from heaven. And that this person would actually speak life and encouragement and allow for the spirit to do the fullness of what God wants to do in them. Can we be those people that believe before we see and, and speak life and truth over those around us when there's even a glimmer of heaven? It's the most beautiful interaction between these women And then Mary breaks into song. It's so wild to me when you read this because she is brilliant. I mean, just, oh, let me just sing a song. My soul magnifies and exalts the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior, for he has looked with loving care on the humble state of his maidservant. Look what she's recognizing. She's talking about the character of God. She she has just said yes to one of the messiest stories. Sure, shame. She's betrothed to a man that does not know yet she's pregnant. She recognizes she hasn't been with anyone yet. This is grounds for divorce. Shame in her family. She very well will be turned out of even the guest house of her family home in Nazareth when she's about to have the baby. She will watch her son die. She will be an outcast. She will be poor. At some point, Joseph disappears. I don't know if she loses him early. The reality is, is the favor of God does not necessarily mean freedom from pain, sorrow, or death. What it does mean is the most exhilarating life you would ever say yes to. The heights and the depths, the fullness of life, and the reality that you are never, ever 
ever alone. She goes on to say, For behold, from now on all generations will count me blessed and happy and favored by God. For he who is mighty has done great things for me. And holy is his name to be worshipped in purity and majesty and glory. And his mercy is upon generation after generation. Toward those who stand, stand in great awe of God and fear him. He has done mighty deeds with his powerful arm. He has scattered those who were proud in the thoughts of their heart. He has brought down rulers from their thrones and exalted those who were humble. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty-handed. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, just as he promised to our fathers, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. What you have to recognize is women in that culture, they, were under, they would have understood the first five books of the Bible. They would have gotten through... Um, Excuse me. <clears throat> they would have gotten through Bet Sefer, which is kind of like Hebrew school for the, for the youngins. But then they would have stepped out of that school. They would have not continued studying the scriptures. They would have understood the Psalms well. And she does quote the Psalms here, but do you know what else she quotes? Habakkuk and Samuel. And she makes reference to Hannah, the one who has Samuel and, and submits him to the temple, to the Lord's service. I mean, she's been listening. She's been paying attention. She's brilliant. She knows the word. She's trusting God, and she's pulling together this beautiful poem, sermon, song that actually reflects the character of God and the goodness of God to all generations. She's stunning to me, and she's like 15. I mean, my goodness. I'm so struck by her heart, her surrender to say yes to something that would surely crush her and also be the salvation of the world. I'm so struck, this next um, piece of art that you will see by Scott Erickson is this sort of cosmic conversation across centuries. And you have Eve, and you see Eve, she's got the apple behind her and a snake wrapped around her ankle and she's looking, I don't know if it's sad or hopeful or both, I think probably both, down at the one who is in Mary's womb. And you imagine these two mothers speaking across generations. And Mary saying, what began in you is finishing in me. And see, she's crushing the serpent's head. Because when Jesus came through the womb of Mary, who she delivered will soon deliver her At his death and resurrection, he destroys the works and the effects of the enemy. And then he sends his spirit to come and take up residence in you and I in the same way that the living God took up residence in Mary. She's a prototype for you and I. That you and I, yes, men and women alike, would be pregnant with the spirit of God. That there'd be things that are meant to take up residence and life meant to come through us. And one of my favorite stories to tell is a story of um, my husband's mom. Marshall, when he was 19, his mom passed away from cancer. It was the second time she had fought it, and she only had three months to live, but enough time to prepare. And my husband talks about it was in that season of watching his mom pass that he saw for the first time, really, what it looked like to have faith, to really trust God. He was like, if she could have that much joy and assurance in the final days of her life, then this has to be real. And it wasn't until after she passed that he really started walking with the Lord, was baptized. We met years later on a blind date. And a few years after that, after getting married and finding out that we were with child, we had our first, Tucker. And I remember being in the hospital room when Marshall's father walked in the room with a pink bag. We had a little boy. (laughs) And this pink bag traveled in and sat on the bed and we looked at it and perplexed, pondered some things. And we opened that bag and inside was a little lamb that when you wound it up played Jesus Loves Me. And there was a letter and there was a cassette tape. And a week after Tucker was born, we had a chance to sneak away between nursings on a quick date in an old Subaru that had a cassette player. And we popped that tape in 
And we listened as Nancy, Marshall's mother, read the letter that she wrote to her first grandchild. And in that letter, she wrote about how she was praying for her son, who, remember, was not yet walking with the Lord. And praying for this little person's mommy, me, Marshall's future wife. And we listened to her voice unpack. She was a prayer warrior, a gentle spirit. And I heard Marshall say, I haven't heard her voice since her funeral. I said, her funeral? He said, yeah, she recorded a sermon and shared the gospel at her funeral. And what I was so struck by is that death did not have the final word that she left us her voice in the same exact way that the Spirit of God has come so that you and I could still have the Father's voice. Do you understand that when Jesus says, like, oh, how long do I have to be here? It's not out of exasperation. It's out of hope because he cannot wait to send the Spirit so that every single one of us can have access to the voice of the living God that we might hear him, that we might behold him, that we might be stirred and actually sense what God wants to bring in and through us. Death does not have the final word. And you and I have the same voice that's been speaking throughout history, the voice that spoke light into darkness, the voice that spoke to a man in the middle of the desert and said, leave your family, the voice that spoke to another one at a burning bush, the voice that spoke to another one in a living room of a teenage girl. That same voice that spoke from heaven and said, you are my beloved son. With you, I am well pleased. And it's the same voice that spoke you and I into being, who formed us in our mother's wombs and who is present right here and now. The same voice. And so I want to invite you just to take a moment to lean in, to suspend disbelief just for a moment. What if? What if that voice wanted to speak to you this morning? What if heaven wanted to encounter you this morning? And I just invite you to ask, God, would you illuminate our imaginations? You gave us every part of us to be able to experience you. And so whether you want to create an experience in our very bodies, if there's a chill, a warmth, a tingle in our hands, if you want to illuminate our imaginations to bring images, pictures, words, God, would the voice that is in us that is not from us be a parent. Would you silence the voice of the enemy, God, would darkness flee? And just ask simply, Jesus, what do you want me to know? What do you want me to know? Whatever comes first and fast is typically the spirit of God. The next is usually the enemy because he's a jerk and he asks the same question that he asked in the garden, which was, is that really God? Did he really say that? And you're like, well, you don't talk to me that way and I don't talk to me that way, which means that leaves one, yes. Ask him, Jesus, what do you want me to know? Take a moment, close your eyes. Jesus, what, what do you want me to know about you? Who do you say that you are? Would you allow him just to paint a picture? Maybe there's a word, a picture, a song. Let him tell you who he is. Let him destroy every old narrative that is untrue. He is with you. He is for you. And like Mary, let him address you as he says that you are. Jesus, who do you say that I am? With wonder, with curiosity, God, who do you say that I am? And whatever comes, receive it deeply. Let it be the beginning of a longer conversation. If it's an image, if it's a word, if it's something confusing, it's usually more glorious than you could imagine, favored one. And then take time and journal and ask, Lord, what else do you want me to know? Would you begin a conversation that's very present-oriented? Not, God, what do you want me to do with my life, but just who do you say that I am? 
Would you illuminate for me just one step before me in the same way that the angel Gabriel does for, for Mary? He gives her just the next right step. This is how the Lord leads us. He's a lamp unto our feet. When you look at a Hebrew oil lamp, it's about the size of my palm. It has a little wick on it, and it basically casts a shadow like a half a foot past my feet. That's about how much light unto your path the Lord most often gives you, right? The next right step. I've come to practice something where each morning I just wake up and I say, God, what would you have me do today? Who do you say that I am, and what do you want me to do? And the first three things that come to mind, I jot them down. It might be play that game with your son you've been talking about, finish that one application you need to do, and clean the kitchen, because that honors your husband. He's kind of a clean freak. <laughs> Simple things. Because I want to be a woman like Mary, that at the end of my day can say, I did what the Lord asked. And every once in a while, there's that day where he says, leave everything and trust me. And we have. And we've watched him provide in ways that I could have never imagined. And so would we be people that trust him for the day to day, the next right step, for the reality that he loves you, he's with you, he knows you, he's for you. I love this phrase, a friend of mine in my master's cohort was having a conversation with John Tyson, who's a wonderful pastor, preacher, and she was asking him, how do you constantly kind of teach and pour out and not get burnt out or defeated or whatnot? And he's Australian, has this lovely accent. He says, I carry around a bubble of wonder. Can you carry around with you a bubble of wonder? I think that's what it is to be full of the spirit of God, that there's constantly wonder. Who are you? What are you doing? Where are you taking me next? How will you navigate through this mess of a world? It is dark and broken, and yet he is with you, and he is for you. You cannot know what is coming. There is very little certainty about those things, but I am certain that he is good, that he is with me and for me, that he loves me. His voice is available, and I trust the same for you. God, this morning we just make space. That beautiful hymn, let every heart prepare him room. God, would we be people who prepare room for you, for your voice to fill, to animate us. Think about Romans 8 where it says, the mature children of God are those who are animated by the impulses of the Spirit of God. Would we be, would we be am, animated in our lives by the impulses of the Spirit? Would we be familiar with you and your suffering and your joy. God, would we be people who are marked by the love of God, that we would overflow in such a way um, that people cannot help but encounter you wherever we go. We thank you that your spirit changes atmospheres and that we, the people of God, have a portable sanctuary of the soul where you dwell, where you reside, that we get to be the temple of the living God. It is scandalous. And so God, give us assurance today that you are here, that you are with us and for us. And as we go out into the world, God, would we bring light and love? Would we be people that live from love? We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Merry Christmas. <laughs>